Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 7862 in the name of Fiona Hisle upon recognise and support Paisley's 2021 UK City of Culture and Dundee's 2023 European Capital of Culture bids. I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 12 minutes or thereabouts, please. Uh, Presiding Officer, I move the motion in my name. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was a season of light, it was a season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. Now these are famous lines uh, open a tale of two cities uh, and, uh, and highlight one of the novel's most prominent motifs and structural figures that of doubles. Throughout Dickens uh, asserts his belief in the possibility of resurrection and transformation, both on a personal and societal level. Fitting then, as we are here to debate two places, Paisley and Dundee, who have such ambitious, transformative and inspiring plans. And before a member interjects to highlight that Paisley isn't a city, Scotland's largest town may not be, but it has the ambitions of one. The timing uh, for this debate is opportune too. Paisley's final bid uh, to become the 2021 UK City of Culture will be submitted on Friday. Uh, Dundee's 2023 European Capital of Culture bid is due in on the 27th of October. Both would be outstanding successes for Scotland, the UK and Europe. And I'm sure the judging panels will appreciate the quality and substance of both bids. A key strength of culture is it invites us to reflect on who we are and give us an understanding of what we can be and become as individuals, as a community, as a town, as a city and as a country. And that's what excites me about Paisley and Dundee's bids. They are committed, bold and ambitious. Paisley and Dundee recognise the fundamental importance of culture to place and the profound impact it has on our very quality of life. And they understand, as we do, the culture is pivotal in our well-being. And their bids say so much about the type of town, city and country they are and want to be. Paisley and Dundee's bids have much in common with one another, with a focus on people, communities and connections. But let me begin with Paisley. Paisley's bid journey has been inspiring. Beginning two years ago, with hundreds of people gathered in the picturesque Paisley Abbey for the official launch, the Paisley bid has been developed through extensive community engagement and the people of Paisley have helped put together a strong bid for Paisley and for Scotland. More than 30,000 people, or buddies, have been engaged in the process of developing the bid, which has broad-based community support. This is part of a broader heritage and culture-led regeneration strategy to transform Paisley into a vibrant cultural and creative destination. And a year-long programme of events is outlined with themes which are authentic to Paisley and have been co-produced with Paisley's communities. And these themes have been inspired by the rich textile heritage of Paisley, the iconic Paisley pattern and the character of the people. The programme is also designed to have wide appeal to a range of audiences and will be inclusive and accessible to all. The bid has reached far and wide, from every Renfrewshire school pupil to limited edition Paisley branded bottles of Johnny Walker to the Paisley pattern set to feature in luxury knitwear, Pringle of Scotland's upcoming autumn winter collection. So Paisley has it all. But perhaps for me, the most imaginative and lasting impression I witnessed involved iconic Paisley landmarks and famous faces being reimagined in a stunning animation Lego film by local teenager Morgan Spence and the 17-year-old perfectly capturing Paisley buddies in action, including actors David Tennant, Jared Butler and singer Paolo Nintini, leading me to reflect, why do all the cool folk come from Paisley? Now, this encapsulates the energy, the enthusiasm and the fresh approach of Paisley's bid. Winning the competition will bring with it significant economic, social and cultural benefits too. Renfrewshire Council have cited the estimated economic boost over a 10-year period is in the region of 4,700 jobs and 172 million gross value added. And I want to pay tribute to the vision and support of the previous and the current leadership of Renfrewshire Council. And I also want to thank Derek Mackay, MSP, and Cabinet Secretary for Finance for his firm financial backing of the bid. 
So I pay tribute to the 2021 Paisley Bid team, some of whom are in the public gallery today. But I also wish to recognise that it is the involvement of the communities of Paisley, the embracing of culture by the entire town, all the buddies, that's, that's what makes Paisley's bid so special. And I also want to recognise the enthusiastic champions of the Paisley bid by local MSPs of all parties. But we're here not just to focus solely on Paisley. This is a, a tale of two places. So uh, in addressing Dundee, I recall standing here in this chamber almost four years ago, offering my full support for Dundee's 2017 UK bid. And whilst they narrowly missed out to Hull, they have been on an incredibly inspiring journey since. In that time, tens of thousands of voices across the city of Discovery, from artists to festival directors, musicians to librarians, bakers to builders, have helped take the city of Discovery to the next level. Dundee led a successful bid to become the UK's first UNESCO Creative City of Design. And the city of Discovery is on a pioneering journey in an illustrious network of cities of design, from Berlin to San Etienne to Bilbao, all outstanding contributors to areas of creativity and design. But Dundee isn't standing still. Dundee is building upon their UNESCO status, learning from other European cities and approaches with its rich cultural heritage and exciting future. Dundee can be a beacon of creativity to the world. A city which continuously seeks to create further opportunities to share and to celebrate. And the V&A Muse Museum of Design Dundee, opening next year with the Scottish Government as the major financial backer, is the flagship development of the city's waterfront regeneration. Securing the v &A has increased the national and international profile of the waterfront development and the city itself. v and Dundee will attract hundreds of thousands of visitors from across Scotland and across the globe, redefining Dundee's offer as a place to visit, to live, to study and to work. So little wonder that Dundonians are striving to become the next uh, European capital of culture city, following on from Glasgow's success uh, for the UK in 1990. To get Dundee to this place, local voices have been heard in schools and community centres, in art galleries and museums, universities and libraries, on buses and on the streets. And the strap line is, be brilliant. And as their bid develops, I am sure that that brilliance will shine through. People are excited, engaged and enthused. A recent edition of the Dundee Courier carried the, the faces and the voices of more than 600 local people with their thoughts about Dundee and Europe an extraordinary endorsement of Dundee's support for being a European city, not just a city in Europe. And I can't give much away before the Dundee bid is submitted, but Dundee's European Capital of Culture Year will be like no other, packed with cultural celebrations that will ignite the heart and show the richness of the region to the rest of Europe. And there will be local, national and international artists involved in a huge range of exciting events and festivals with practic practitioners from Stirling to Stornoway to Seville. Gaming, digital and design are all at the heart of the bid and they'll be key factors, I think, in helping secure the win. Dundee are theming their bid around the concept of connections and their bid as an exciting opportunity to strengthen Scotland's cultural ties with Europe and celebrate our diverse cultural heritage and this is the bid for the city, but also for the region. And so Angus and Perth and Fife are all contributing creatively to the bid, and it's a bid for Scotland. Local MSPs, Shona Robertson and Joe Fitzpatrick, who will be closing this debate for the government, are passionate advocates for Dundee and the bid. And there are tangible benefits to this designation too. Dundee site, it will bring 1,600 jobs, 500,000 extra visitors, and the Tay Cities area's GDP would grow by 4.5%. So the programme events for the year would leave a lasting legacy. So Dundee's bid will create new partnerships and ventures, explore new ways to reach out and inspire new audiences at home and around the world, promoting our cultural and creative talent and showcasing our inspiring building design and places to our European partners. So while Scotland is steeped in meaning and history, it is continually as a country on the move, celebrating its past while seeking new and innovative ways to engage with the world. And we're a country where we're proud of our diverse heritage and traditions, but continually are seeking to create opportunities to share and to celebrate. 
So if we reflect more, uh, more of this perspective nationally, working in partnership with Glasgow, our national agencies and other partners, the Glasgow Commonwealth Games, delivered a hugely successful and vibrant year for Scotland. And we demonstrated the richness of our cultural life and the depth of our talent, celebrating the very best of Scotland's creativity and cultural heritage. And the world was watching. And the Commonwealth Games Federation highlighted it was the best games ever and the accompanying cultural programme was a significant factor in that uh, success. And we're looking forward to the upcoming European Championships next year, highlighting that Scotland is a great, uh, welcoming and culturally rich destination to visitors from around the world. So events and cultural events connected can really make a big difference to attracting people to visit Scotland and very much the bids both from Paisley and indeed a secured would actually, I think in terms of Scotland's events, be a, a huge addition to what we can do in telling that cultural story and using culture to bring people to the country. They have a huge impact on Scotland's visitor economy in terms of income generated, but more importantly, they enable more people to access, enjoy, participate in and benefit from the wide range of benefits that these engagements deliver to individuals, communities and nationally. And there are other benefits as well. The confidence to be creative, to be imaginative, to shape, direct the future, both on these shores and beyond. So I'm excited about these potential, uh, the potential that these bids offer for Paisley, Dundee, Scotland, the rest of the UK and Europe. Culture has a vital role in promoting outward-looking, welcoming and progressive values, perhaps more important now than they have even been in recent years. International engagement makes a crucial contribution to sustainable economic growth, bringing different perspective, ideas and new partnerships. And I want a Scotland where people are free to express their creativity, a nation that is confident in participating on the world stage where we build cultural bridges with our European and international partners. And these connections, the relationships we build from them, and the value of our Scottish brand and heritage helps open doors across the world. Paisley and Dundee's bids are exciting prospects. They fit well with the government's ambitions. We recognise the significant contribution they make to Scotland's rich cultural life and the local and national boosts these successes will bring. In a tale of two cities, Dickens created and developed a theme of regeneration. Dundee and Paisley are two places with innovative, inspiring and engaging plans to re-energise, reinvent and reimagine. So I'm pleased to be able to confirm this government's support for Paisley 21's bid to be the UK City of Culture and Dundee's 2023 European Capital of Culture bid and I commend the motion to Parliament. Thank you very much. Uh, before I call the next speaker, I'm going to remind members if you want to speak in a debate, there's a wee thing you have to do. Press your request to speak button. I now call Liam Kerr, please, to open for the Conservatives. Eight minutes or thereabouts, Mr Kerr. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to be speaking in this debate today, and I'm grateful to Fiona Hislop for giving the Parliament the opportunity to signal our support for both the Paisley 2021 UK City of Culture bid and the Dundee 2023 European Capital of Culture bid. The Scottish Conservatives recognise the significant contributions that the communities of Paisley and Dundee have made and continue to make to Scotland's culture and the enormous local, national and international benefits that these hopefully successful bids will bring. And that is why I will be pleased to vote in favour of the motion today. Turning first to the UK City of Culture, the inaugural holder was Derry Londonderry in 2013. In 2017, Kingston-upon-Hull took the title. If successful, Paisley will become the third UK city of culture and the first Scottish holder of the title. Now, those of a legal persuasion will know all about Paisley. It was the hallowed ground where in 1928, a Mrs. Donoghue allegedly, that's a legal joke, found a dead snail in a bottle of ginger beer, became ill, sued Mr. Stevenson, the manufacturer, and created the modern concept of negligence and the general principles of duty of care. And as a result, there was a pilgrimage to Paisley in 1990, and there are a memorial plaque and bench at the cafe site. But beyond this, other than away trips to Love Street in the 80s and 90s, and there's an irony, uh, Fiona Hislop mentioned doubling of cities. When St Mirren won the Scottish Cup in 1987, it was against one of the Dundee teams, of course. Uh, other than those away trips, other than visits to the annual boat jumble sale at St. Mirren Park and a penchant in my adolescence for Paisley pattern shirts, it wasn't somewhere I'd spent much time. But the town has a rich cultural history, 
coming to prominence with the establishment of its 12th century abbey, which has long been considered an important religious hub. It also boasts a number of Victorian-style buildings, including the town hall, an arts centre and a museum, as well as the famous Russell Institute. Now, by the 19th century, Paisley had also established itself as the centre of the weaving industry, giving its name to the Paisley shawl and the Paisley pattern. And that's why I'm delighted to see Paisley in the running, because there are game-changing results off the back of this award. And the impact on this town, legitimately bidding as a city, as the Cabinet Secretary says, could be considerable. Paisley's bid focuses on improving the town by attracting more visitors, increasing media interest, and bringing members of the community together. And the town predicts that a successful bid will create the equivalent of 4,700 jobs over the next decade and boost the economy by £172 million. It would also result in a programme of major events and world-class culture, which, by Paisley's own analysis, would bring 1.7 million attendances. Businesses, institutions and celebrities have all supported Paisley's bid, and indeed the town itself has even sent a patch of Paisley pattern into space in July 2000. 2016. And it is that which is surely the biggest cause of celebration, because Paisley already has a unique culture and an abundance of heritage at its disposal. And the Scottish Government is right to focus on tourism as an economic driver. It is reported by Visit Scotland just today, on World Tourism Day of course, as the third largest export industry in the world. And it is awards like this which also promote internal tourism to help make the town a key destination of choice, generating income, creating jobs, and stimulating social change. And few cities have done more in the past to achieve that than Dundee. The motion calls for recognition of Dundee's rich cultural her heritage and exciting future, and rightly so. As early as the 12th century, Dundee has established itself as an important East Coast trading port. Then came its profound success again in the textile industry and the subsequent phasing out of the linen export trade which led to a surge and dominance in jute production throughout the latter half of the 19th century. The rise of the textile industry has brought an expansion of supporting industries, notably whaling, maritime, shipbuilding, as well as the likes of James Keelers and Sons, pioneers of the production of commercial marmalade and the founding of publishing firm DC Thompson. However, that city of jute, jam and journalism has been through some tough times, seeing significant unemployment and losing around a quarter of its population over the last 30 years. I well remember travelling through from St Andrews in the early 90s and seeing the city then. How different it is now. Because this city not only has an exciting future, but it has created the atmosphere of a city with a future. Now, since being elected, I've spent a great deal of time in Dundee, noting the culture everywhere. Others will no doubt talk about the V&A, the Discovery, the Waterfront Development, all part of a one billion regeneration programme. But there is so much more going on. Culture manifests in the widest sense in Dundee, like the Dundee Botanic Gardens, stretching over nine hectares near the banks of the River Tay, within walking distance of the V&A and attracting 80,000 visitors a year. With its impressive gardens and new cafe facilities, it is not hard to see why. I spent time at the Dundee Museum of Transport, which opened in 2014 to showcase the cultural transport heritage of Tayside and beyond, and has since acquired the historic Maryfield Tram Depot, which it seeks to restore. I was transfixed and psychologically challenged last year when I attended a production by Dundee Rep's Youth Theatre called Experiment One Abandoned, written and performed by the young people, which took place at the Mills Observatory. Now, if that's not European leading culture and creativity, I don't know what is. The motion talks of the local, national and international boost that would follow, and it would. The opportunity proposes a £40 million roster of up to 80 events, including six major arts festivals and international events, a, quote, once in a generation showcase for Scotland's creative and cultural talent. Dundee predicts the title could create 1,600 full-time job opportunities and bring an additional £128 million to the local economy, vital when it is considered that Dundee's unemployment rate is far in excess of the national average. As the Cabinet Secretary also said, it also predicts a 4.5% increase in regional GDP and a 50% short-term increase in tourism, along with a 17% long-term increase. Deputy Presiding Officer, Dundee does not contend for this accolade. It is merely claiming what it rightfully ought to have. To my mind, Dundee already is a European capital of culture. The bids by Paisley and Dundee, if successful, 
will promote the best that Scotland has to offer by showcasing our cultural and our creative talents and further promoting them as vibrant destinations of choice, enticing visitors from all over the UK and the world to see for themselves some of the best that Scotland has to offer. The Scottish Conservatives wholeheartedly support this and wish both Paisley and Dundee the very best with their respective bids and look forward to supporting the motion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. I call Neil Bibby to open for Labour. Seven minutes, please, Mr Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. It's a pleasure to open this debate on behalf of the Labour Party mm -hmm. and speak in support of both Paisley's bid for UK City of Culture in 2021 and Dundee's bid for European Capital Culture in 2023. Both are important titles and the very process of bidding, well as the Scottish Government motion sets out, promotes Scotland's cultural and creative talent and showcases its inspiring building design and places to UK and European partners. As someone who was born in Paisley, lives in Paisley today and who represents the town, it won't surprise you uh, to hear that my contribution today will focus mainly on Paisley's 2021 bid. Paisley is a proud town with a proud past. A small market town that was transformed by the Industrial Revolution, Paisley became a world-leading uh, producer of textiles. As we've heard, the weavers, the thread mills, the world-renowned Paisley pattern, that industry shaped our history, our economy, our culture and our heritage. It's part of the town's social tapestry. If you visit Paisley, you will see that the built, uh, Paisley's built heritage represents one of the most impressive townscapes in Scotland. The town centre has over 100 listed buildings, only second to Edinburgh. The 850-year-old abbey that stands in the centre of the town today links modern Paisley with pre-industrial Paisley. It's not just a historic building, it is a living, active building with tours, concerts and services all year round, the jewel of the crown in our townscape. We are proud in Paisley, um, not just of our buildings, but of our people too. Paisley has given the world great actors, poets, artists, musicians and sports people. People like David Tennant, uh, Gerard B Butler, uh, Robert Tannehill, John Byrne, Archie Gemmell, Jerry Rafferty, to name uh, but a few. And Paolo Nutini himself will be um, backing the bid at a special one-off uh, concert at Paisley Abbey in October as part of the Spree Festival. And I would encourage uh, members to come along and enjoy the Spree Festival. We should also recognise, though, the organisations uh, in Paisley have supported and nurtured uh, young Paisley talent over many years. Organisations like Loud and Proud and the Pace Youth Theatre Company, uh, the UK's largest independent theatre company. Uh, and, it, and if, as uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, if anyone hasn't seen the stop motion video by another young talent, Morgan Spence, in support of the bid, then I would uh, also highly recommend uh, many faces already been mentioned and others like the broadcaster Andrew Neil uh, have featured in a Lego celebration of Paisley 2021. But the bid is not just about celebrating Paisley, it's about making a difference. Winning City of Culture title would provide a major economic boost to Paisley and Renfrewshire. It's estimated that 1.7 million visitors will visit in 2021, that over 4,500 jobs could be created over a 10-year period. As City of Culture, uh, we could host more highlights from Britain's cultural calendar, arts and music festivals, performances, concerts, awards and, uh, and shows. Uh, a successful bid would help every child in Renfrewshire access new activities as we break down barriers to inclusion and make arts and culture act more accessible. I believe the bid has the potential to transform Paisley. We're already seeing it as an opportunity to build a new sense of pride in Paisley, not just civic pride, but a real appreciation of where the town has come from and where it is going. Presiding officer, I would like to congratulate all those who have made Paisley's 2021 City of Culture bid a reality. I would like to pay tribute to the local partnership that has been driving the bid forward, the bid team, the council and the wider community working together. I also think it's important to recognise that we would not be debating this bid at all if it were not for the leadership of Mark McMillan, the former leader of Renfrewshire Council, as well as a number of other elected members who have been supportive, the bid director, Jean Cameron, and every team member working on the bid. I pay tribute to all the people and organisations within the community that are right behind the bid. Many of them joined us at a reception that I co-hosted in the Parliament last year, and I can tell you the enthusiasm from them uh, was infectious and is infectious. There's a real sense that the momentum is with Paisley 
and it is growing. Just to be shortlisted for UK's City of Culture in itself is a huge achievement, but Paisley is in it to win it. That means we have to impress a judging panel that is not just considering the merits of Paisley's case, but considering the case for four other candidate cities across the UK. Paisley's bid is Scotland's bid. Of course it is. But to win, however, it has to be much more than that. It has to be recognised as the UK wide as the best bid in Britain, winning out over Coventry, Stoke on Trent, Sunderland and Swansea. And I think it is the best bid across the UK. All supporters of the bid, including the Scottish Government, need to get behind Paisley 2021 to make Paisley's case across the UK over the coming months. Within this, with this in mind, I was extremely encouraged to see the members of the All for One Choir from the current host city hall come to Paisley to perform build, uh, and build links with the town and show their support. And I thought one of the most interesting com contributions inspired by the bid was from Warrington man Dan Warren. After his hometown failed uh, to reach the shortlist, he designed a London-style uh, tube map of Renfrewshire to try and get uh, Paisley noticed. Presiding officer, cross-party support for the bid has been remarkable. I'm delighted that there is a consensus in the Parliament today and I welcome the government funding um, announced by the Cabinet Secretary just the other uh, day. I also want to thank uh, personally Kezia Dugdale for the support she has shown uh, for Paisley. Even when another candidate city in Scotland was still in the competition, she recognised Paisley 2021 as was important to the renewal of the town and gave us her backing. The first political uh, leader to do so. And we've seen cross-party support uh, here and also from Scotland's MPs who have met with the bid team in London. Locally, uh, there's cross-party support in Renfrewshire as well, as Cabinet Secretary made reference to. It was under the previous Labour administration that the City of Culture bid was, convinced, uh, was conceived. And now it's up to the new SNP administration to take the bid forward and they have Labour's full support in doing so. It's important that Renfrewshire Council continue to provide leadership, practical support and the resources needed to keep up the momentum and to take Paisley's case far and wide. President Officer, the reasons for backing Paisley's bid are similar to the reasons why I believe we should back Dundee's bid for European capital culture too. Using culture and heritage to transform a place and provide more opportunities for those who live there. In some ways that transformation has already begun in Dundee. The city is not just known for jam, jute and journalism anymore. It's known uh, as the UK's first UNESCO city of design and recognised globally for its contribution to medical research, comics and video games. The VNA will open next year. And the I'm afraid I understand why we Paisley got the biggest hit. You've run out of time okay. for Dundee, I'm afraid. Well, but I, I wish, won't hold it against I wish, you. I wish Dundee and Paisley <laughs> every success in their bids over the, over the coming months. I'm Thank sure you, you do. <laughs> We now move to the open debate. It is speeches of six minutes. I call Ross Greer to be followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We're incredibly fort uh, fortunate in Scotland to have a rich cultural heritage, one which is known, respected, and enjoyed across the world. To see that recognised through two successful City of Culture bids for Paisley in 2021 and Dundee in 2023 would be a fitting recognition of both a rich cultural heritage and the vibrant contemporary scenes in both cities. In fact, the whole world has been contributing towards these bids. Just last week, we had the Singing Children of Africa Choir in Paisley Town Hall joining local school children, a local gospel choir and dance troops to put on uh, an amazing performance. In the last members' debate on Paisley's bid, a number of us highlighted the radical history of the city's industrial working class, centred, of course, around weaving and the world-famous Paisley pattern. The history of workers' struggles and their effects on wider society is embedded in the culture of Paisley, as it is across Scotland and the world. This radicalism has shaped Paisley's culture for centuries. It was an epicentre of the Radical War in 1820. A memorial march was held there following the Peterloo Massacre, and this march also led to heavy-handed suppression by the authorities, including cavalry charges. These actions led on to radical activity across Scotland, particularly around the West Coast, in support of more representative government. The Radical War ended with charges of treason, executions, and exile to penal colonies, but its effects were felt, not least through the Reform Act eventually passed in 1832, which began to expand the right to vote beyond just the most powerful sections of society. And it was Paisley's working class who played a driving role in that. And Paisley has the distinction of being the only Scottish city named in Marx's Tome Das Kapital. I do miss having the presence of Richard Leonard here for this debate. He was very enthusiastic the last time I mentioned it. <laughs> 
in it he refers to, and I quote, the brave Scots of Paisley and the labour that they pour into their production of textiles. He highlight, uh, highlights Carlisle Sun and Company as one of the oldest and most respected companies producing cotton and linen in the west of Scotland in operation as far back as 1752. Though, as you would expect, Marx took a dim view of the Carlisle family and a more positive view of the workers in their mills. Paisley's radical history extended well into the 20th century. Britain's last communist MP, Willie Gallagher, was born there. And though Gallagher was eventually elected to the West Fife constituency, a lot of his political activism was focused around the West Coast during the Red Clydeside era. Gallagher was, for example, heavily involved in the campaign for a 40-hour working week after the end of the First World War. And he was one of the strike leaders negotiating with the authorities in Glasgow city chambers when the Battle of George Square began, leading to the British government's deployment of troops across the city. Willie Gallagher died back in Paisley in 1965. It was almost 100 years after Marx wrote about the brave Scots of Paisley, and Gallagher had most certainly carried that tradition throughout his life. Unfortunately, the likes of Carlisle Sun & Company do not produce textiles in Paisley anymore. The industrial nature of the city is long gone, and so are the jobs and relative prosperity which came with it. Textile production essentially ceased in the 90s. The rich cultural heritage of Paisley's past is still visible, though. Whether it's in the town hall paid for by one old mill owner or in the museum that was paid for by another or in the multitude of streets named after the industry, Dyer's Wine, Cotton Street, Thread Street. However, the decline of the weaving industry along with shipbuilding industry and the broader process of deindustrialization has left Paisley with huge challenges, high levels of deprivation. Ferguson Park is one of the most deprived areas of the country and Paisley Job Centre has the highest number of sanctions in the west of Scotland. But we know that Paisley is a brilliant city of fantastic communities. It is already a city of culture. This bed is about so much more than that. It's about ensuring that Paisley's rich cultural heritage can be strengthened to raise the city's profile and to address the problems that it faces. And whether Paisley wins City of Culture 2021 or not, the very process of this bid is doing so much good. Remshire Council and the Scottish Government have already set out to invest in supporting local arts and cultural initiatives. By winning the award, though, much more can be done to raise the profile of this historic town, to encourage tourism and investment that it so very much needs, and to give the community themselves better access to better cultural experiences. Though I am a West of Scotland MSP, it would be impolite of me not to mention Dundee's bid for European City of Culture as well. Dundee actually shares a remarkably similar history to Paisley, with textiles and shipbuilding being staples of the industrial, historical industrial economy. Dundee's economy was a bit more varied though. As has been mentioned already, it said that it was built on the three J's of jute, journalism and jam. It's certainly deserving of the European Capital of Culture title, having focused on a culture-led regeneration strategy since the 90s. Dundee's also embraced cutting-edge technology and become a centre for the creation of video games, in the process making Scotland an international hub for that ever-growing industry. The classic lemmings and the record-breaking if controversial Grand Theft Auto were created by Dundee-based DMA Design, now known as Rockstar North, now our neighbours here in Edinburgh. Dundee is somewhere I can say with absolute honesty that I've enjoyed every visit that I've ever made there uh, and I really do wish them well in their bid. Both cities have contributed so much over the uh, centuries to the culture that we enjoy today. And whilst they absolutely deserve the titles they're bidding for, I'm grateful for the benefits that are being reaped simply by engaging in this process. I look forward to us returning here to Parliament following the announcements that Paisley and Dundee have both been recognised as deserving city of, cities of culture in the years to come. But before that, I would invite all members who are available to join us in Paisley on Friday morning at half past ten to send off the bid. Thank you very much, Mr Greer. Call Alec Cole Hamilton, be followed by George Adam. Mr Hamilton, please. Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Growing up in a small farming village outside of St Andrews in the 80s and 90s, Dundee was a metropolis to me. Uh, 14 miles to the north, it always held a certain kind of magnetism. It was where we went for Christmas shopping or pantomimes at the Rep for ice skating. My comics were authored in its bustling streets and its swimming pool had the finest blooms on the eastern seaboard. It basked in seemingly endless sunshine on the side of a river that we crossed more times than I can remember. Each time we passed that tree hung with Jif lemon bottles on the side of the bridge, my sister and I would lisp out lines of McGonagall about the Tay below us and the whale that once got stuck there. We talk about the ancient rail tragedy that still endured in the city's consciousness and local song. And we relive our memories of the day in 1986 when the RSS Discovery 
one of the most significant vessels of scientific exploration ever built, returns home to the captivated rapture of this eight-year-old boy. In later years, I would return with equal regularity, but for very different reasons. I learned to drive there. The sticky carpets of the Mardi Gras represented the nearest nightclub to the bars of St Andrews where I learned to drink. It's at that time I also learned to appreciate the very Dundonian sound of Michael Mara, uncle to Jenny Mara of this parish. And I would work there at Fairbridge in Dundee in Kemback Street, delivering independent living skills and exploring cultural identity through youth work with the hardest to reach young people in Dundee's inner city. I reflect in particular on the Fairbridge totem pole. It was carved by young people affected by substance use and installed in Dudhope Park as a lasting monument to the triumph of culture and art over the very worst of Dundee's social challenges. I don't get there as much as I would like these days, and I regret that. It's a city that embodies Scotland's transition from heavy industry to world-leading software development, from crushing deprivation to cultural enlightenment, evident in the work of the Community Arts Centre and in the excitement around the opening of the V and A. It's always been a city of culture to me. It certainly shaped the course of my future as it has shaped the course of Scotland's future, and it, as such, rightly deserves the recognition of that on the international stage. Turning my attention to culture in the West, and good culture is always found in the West, and I should declare an interest presiding officer, I've got tickets to see Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds at the Hydro tonight. I want to lend my voice to the unanimous support offered in this chamber to Paisley and its bid to become UK City of Culture. To my shame, I know far less about Paisley than I do about Dundee. But since I was first inducted into this parliament, I have enjoyed the passion of George Adam and his soliloquies about the many assets and strengths of the community he represents. And he's done a grand job in persuading me of the town's history and many attributes in its ability to both overcome and to renew. It's a town that re has reared some of my closest friends and, uh, and it hosts the university that educated my party's leader a resilient and proud community which has left its mark on global fashion. It's certainly come a long way since 1697 and the last mass execution of witches in Western Europe. Paisley has seen a history of culture and ind industry walk hand in hand through the burgeoning textile and weaving trade of the 19th century and in patterns of Kashmiri origin patronized by Queen Victoria, which subsequently catapulted the town's name and produce into both global demand and repute. Now that recognition and sense of identity stood in defiance to the Luftwaffe's bombers in the Blitz and economic malaise down the decades. However, it is important to recognize that the cost of these still took their toll. And as we have heard from Ross Greer, that Fergusley Park was indeed named as one of the most deprived areas of Scotland last year. These ingredients unquestionably qualify it as UK city of culture, not just for the raw and natural creativity it has exhibited through the ages, but for the resilience it displays and the benefits that such a status could afford. We know the value that such recognition can bring to a community, with the promise of over 4,000 jobs and a £172 million boost to the economy that this status would promise. Presiding officer, it's quite alien for me as a constituency member to wax lyrical about the virtues of communities outside of West Edinburgh, but to do so today has been an effortless task. And I'm struck at the warmth that exists right across this chamber on all of the benches for both. Days like today are very welcome in the conduct of the affairs of this parliament. They challenge us as members to think about the virtues and challenges facing communities beyond our own and to embrace a national pride that so often becomes a pawn in a wider discourse around constitutional future of our nation. As such, presiding officer, I'm very proud today to rise in support of the government motion and offer the full-throated support of these benches to both cities in their bids. Thank you. Thank you very much. I haven't called you yet, Mr Adam. I know you're dead keen. I call George Adam to fall by Maurice Corey, please. Thank you, presiding officer. My calves we haven't coped too well. We're just poised to stand up there. <laughs> uh, I am, of course, extremely pleased to take part in this debate. A whole afternoon of positive paisliness will do me nicely. And uh, can I also welcome Jean Cameron and some of her members of Team Paisley who are in the chamber here today. The Cabinet Secretary is, of course, correct when she says it is a tale of two cities. Although my friend and colleague Joe Fitzpatrick says that I must mention Dundee in their quest for European City of Culture in 2023, 
But when looking at Scotland's towns, partnerships has a facility on their webpage that allows you to get all the statistical data for Scotland's towns. And on checking this website yesterday, I found that Paisley is very much like Dundee. When you check the statistics, the demography of both are very similar. Historically, they are both towns that are, had to deal with post-industrial decline. But instead of complaining about it, both have decided to do something completely different. I know that Dundee has been on this journey of discovery longer than we have, but both are trying to show the world who they really are. And when I was elected in 2011, I said I would take a Team Paisley approach to absolutely everything I did as Paisley's MSP. And now we have Team Paisley becoming Team Scotland as the whole of our historic town uh, are taking this approach. What is important about this is what we can achieve. That's the exciting part. This bid can be the catalyst that can make a difference in people's lives and hopefully show the world what 21st century Paisley has to offer. Paisley buddies are now looking to what we can do, looking at the many challenges and seeing how we can look at solutions. There is an air in the town that the impossible can happen. There are no problems, there are only solutions. Paisley has challenges like many other towns in Scotland, but it also has a big heart. It is a heart that beats louder by the day. Buddies are very emotional about our town, but who wouldn't be? It's such a great place. Archie Gemmel from Glenburn, scorer of that goal in the 1978 World Cup. My dad's apprentice he was at Balfour Kilpatrick. It has such great venues as Coates Memorial Church, which recently announced a multi-million pound reimagination of the building for the 21st century along with other plans from Paisley Community Trust for a £40 million cinema theatre space in the very heart of the town. Paisley is, of course, the last resting place of Marjorie Bruce in Paisley Abbey. Marjorie Bruce, the mother of the Stuart dynasty in Scotland and daughter of one of our country's greatest heroes, Robert the Bruce. I could not... Uh, I, Former SNP councillor, sadly no longer with us, Jim Mitchell would never forgive me if I too didn't mention Paisley's connection with the 18 to 1820 insurrection. Paisley is a place where the cottage weavers of the 19th century became very radical in their political ideals. Of course, the Paisley weavers were to the forefront of the insurrection of 1820, although to say that, presiding officer, is inaccurate, as the people of Paisley decided that this insurrection was happening in 1819. A mass rally was organised in Paisley on Saturday the 11th of September. Radicals came from all over the west of Scotland. A crowd of 18,000 gathered at a meeting place outside the town as a band from Nielsen played Scots Wahey. There were many speakers that day and as the crowd dispersed, some decided they were going to march down the high street. By 10pm, the riot act was read and the cavalry were charging down the streets of Paisley, pursuing peaceful protesters. But, presiding officer, this is Paisley. The crowds were not deterred and pitched battles occurred for several days. It wasn't until a week later, on September the 18th, that an uneasy quiet returned to the town. One year later, they would all be part of the Scottish insurrection of 1820 and march under the banner Scotland Free or a Desert. But Paisley is not just a town of uh, political radicals. We have given the world so much culturally as well. Fergusley Park, where my own family come from, if you type Fergusley into an internet search engine, it will give you stats on deprivation. But deprivation is never defined, Fergusley. This is part of the town that has given us singer-songwriter Jerry Rafferty and playwright artist John Byrne. Mr Byrne recently told The Herald, Paisley is a remarkable place. I hope to be involved and I support the bid. I support it wholeheartedly. I thank Fergusley Park every day of my life for providing me all the information I ever needed about life. It was the best place I have ever been. Words that we should all take to heart when uh, discussing this debate as well, presiding officer. Paisley is also a town that helped reclaim the Stone of Destiny on Christmas Day of 1950 in the guise of Ian Hamilton, another Paisley buddy. At a time when the SNP vote rarely registered, Mr Hamilton and his friends decided to take actions into their own hands and reclaim their national identity. Yes, presiding officer, it appears that anything of any value that has happened in Scotland has a Paisley connection. There was Robert Tannehill, a poet of one, and one of the founding members of Paisley's Burns Club, which is the oldest constituted Burns Club in the world. A weaver poet whose life was less than happy. The love of his life married his best friend. His father died at a young age and he had to support the family. A small collection of his poems and songs sold out in 1807. But by 1810, after rejection for his work and for publication, he burned all his manuscripts and drowned himself in Paisley Canal. Unfortunately for Robert Tannehill, he was not to be aware that his work was celebrated in his hometown in the 21st century. But it's about telling the world the fantastic story of our town, its history, its achievements, but most importantly, the story of its people. 
Paisley Buddies. For me, it's my town, my home and my place in the world. It's the place my family have been since 1759. It's the home of my beloved football team, St Murnay FC. But some people have said to me, if this bit is successful, uh, the city of culture will put Paisley back in the map. I say that's wrong. How can you put something in the map when your home is already the centre of the universe? In 1990, in closing, presiding officer, during Glasgow's European city of culture, one of the highlights was a concert by Francis Sinatra, Albert Sinatra at Ibrox. A 74-year-old began the show with uh, You Make Me Feel So Young. As the rain poured, he continued with Come Rain and Shine. And they say the Americans don't get irony, presiding officer. But I want those kind of memories for both of our cities. So to paraphrase Mr Sinatra, Paisley is and always shall be my kind of town. Maurice Corrie, followed by Graeme Day, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, gosh, Maurice Corrie, follow that. Um, as I say, in the footsteps of George Adam, well done. Uh, I would like to start by stating how extremely pleased I was to uh, see that Dundee will be going ahead with the planned events for the UK City of Culture in 2023 bid, despite narrowly missing, narrowly missing out on this a few years ago. This decision just emulates the great spirit of the city of Dundee, and these events will bring fantastic benefits to the town and to the city, uh, both economically and socially. My connection with Dundee goes back quite a long way and is twofold in serving with the Black Watch, which is the city's own, uh, own Highland Regiment based at Oliver Barracks and currently with the Highland Reserve Forces and Cadets Association in Perth Road in Dundee. I was therefore elated to see that they have announced that their, their city is going to run for the city, European City of Culture in 2023. Now the aims of Dundee's bid are something we should all be proud of, to connect people, to inspire young people, and to reach their possibilities, to encourage everyone to live better and to celebrate the city's green space. Of course, a successful bid will bring huge benefits to the city and those who live there as well as the wider country. I would wish and like to wish the city of Dundee every success in this going forward. I would now like to turn and offer my congratulations to Paisley, which is dear to my heart, for their nomination for the title of UK City of Culture 2021. I was truly delighted that Paisley has been recognised in such a way. And I think it's a testament to the beauty of our cities, the activities and events going on in them, and our nation's rich cultural heritage that so many cities have been shortlisted in recent years. And it goes to show the truly wonderful country in which we live. Of course, Paisley is in my West Scotland region, and therefore I would love this bid to be successful. I am very glad that the Scottish Government gave financial backing to the bid, and for that I thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Because in doing so, it is recognising the, the contribution Paisley makes to Scotland's culture, and as a whole, of course, demonstrates that it is supporting this bid and seeks to deliver it. Sadly, there has never been a Scottish winner of the UK City of Culture, and it would make me immensely proud as a representative of the region if Paisley were to be the first. It is important to note that Paisley winning this title will bring immeasurable benefits to the town. It is set to create 5,000 jobs over the decade and bolster the local economy by £172 million, which we know will provide a lasting legacy for the Renfrewshire area. This is not to mention all the events that are planned for the area should the bid be successful. It is predicted that these events will be attended by up to 1.7 million people. This hugely increased footfall should enable plans to go into motion for a brand new town centre, which shows off Paisley's culture and heritage and puts tourism right at its heart. All of this in turn will only increase people's knowledge of Paisley's international story and wonderful heritage, giving new life to the image both here in Scotland and further afield. I was very fortunate to be employed as a general apprentice with JP Coates Limited, that fine textile company, when I first left school and I'm fully aware of the international legacy of Paisley. I worked in the Fergus Lee Mills, Fergus Lee Dye Works and Anchor Mills and experienced the real buzz of spinning threads in Paisley. We know with new technology now in our grasp, this buzz could easily return as it has now reached Lancashire already. Coates was the first UK company to have an employee pension scheme and its own employee hospital. The hospital was situated on the Glenifer Braes, specialising in curing TB patients. The, the idea being that the fresh air up there would cure TB, despite the weather. The legacy of J.P. Coates is all around Paisley, with such buildings as George Adams has mentioned, the Coates Memorial Church, amongst others, which is going through a fantastic renovation. It will be a great moment for the history of Paisley and its people to win its bid. 
What's more, this award will also benefit those most vulnerable in our society, as well as those whose voices often go unheard, older people who are now more isolated, those on lower incomes, and young people all set uh, to benefit from it. The wide-ranging events will bring people from the community together where they can enjoy music, arts, performance, dance, and of course, friendship, and, when, and where there will be inclusion for all. I would like especially to thank George Adams and Neil Bibby and the Renfrewshire Council team for their great efforts with this bid. And above all, George Adams' abundant enthusiasm for Paisley is completely legend. This Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, Paisley is a fantastic place to live and work, and its warm people and rich, interesting cultural heritage deserve to be honoured in this way. I truly hope that Paisley does indeed become the UK City of Culture in 2021. I wish them all the best for the future, and I look forward to attending many of the planned events when the time comes. And indeed, I am very proud to be an honorary Paisley buddy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Corey. I call Graham Day to be followed by Mary Fee. Mr. Day, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, let me at least attempt to make a stronger case for the City of Discovery, as George Adam did for Paisley. But let me do so first by offering a degree of context around my support for Dundee's bid to become the European Capital of Culture 2023. I first visited Dundee in December 1979. That sticks in my memory because I had to overcome a national bus strike to see my favourite band, The Jam, perform at the Caird Hall. My impression as a 17-year-old was of a grey, rather grim place. Fast forward to 1985 and I'd moved to Dundee to live and work in the city. The six years that followed was a mixed experience. I'd come from affluent, bustling Aberdeen to a place so lacking the vibrancy and positivity of the Granite City. I could never have imagined that here we would be in 2017 with it bidding to become a European capital of culture. But well, it might. Presiding officer, because the transformation since my first visit and the time when I lived in the city has, in so many regards, been utterly astonishing. My constituency of Angus South now borders a vibrant, confident city, a city on the up, looking to the future. Let's, as this debate demands, look at its cultural offering and start with Dundee Rep. And I best begin with a proud dad declaration. My actress daughter was a graduate trainee there. The Rep is unique in Scotland in having to, uh, a permanent acting ensemble, and it's also home to the Scottish Dance Theatre. The ensemble remains a crucible of talent, creating the new artists of tomorrow through its graduate scheme, which now offers drama school graduates the opportunity to join Dundee Rep for up to one year. The Rep importantly believes that the highest quality theatre should be available to all. I know that this includes taking some of its productions out beyond its own four walls and into the community across the city and other locations with EC and Carnoustie in my constituency among the places the Rep has reached. Earlier this year, the Rep won three prizes at the Critics Award for Theatre in Scotland for its production of Death of a Salesman, including the Best Production, Best Ensemble and Best Male Performance. As members will know, there's a huge amount of regeneration taking place in Dundee, centred on the waterfront with the V&A as its centrepiece. This is an example of an area realising the need to think long term. The Dundee Central Waterfront uh, Master Plan was actually published back in 2001, looking forward right through to 2031. The V&A will provide Scotland with an international design museum due to open next year, and it's really taking shape in a variety of ways. The exhibition galleries will host international touring exhibitions from the V&A, making Dundee the only location in the UK outside of London to make such globally significant offerings. Visitor forecasts indicate that up to 350,000 people could be attracted to V&A every year. That's brilliant news, not just for Dundee, but Angus and the wider region. And it was great to see that long before its opening, the V&A was engaging with schools. The first project was the Schools Design Challenge, which is open to all S1 pupils in Dundee and Angus, with Arbroath Academy and Webster's High School from my constituency, two of the ten chosen to attend the de uh, design jam. A few yards away from the v &A and we have Swessor Gardens. Thousands of people have already congregated there to watch uh, acts such as Little Mix and Ollie Mars. Hardly a patch, I would suggest, on bands like the Jam that have graced the nearby Caird Hall, but nonetheless extremely popular. Don't worry, Cabinet Secretary, I don't know you're a fellow Jam fan. I'm not looking for you to concur with that opinion. And Dundee's reputation for popular music was, of course, further enhanced in August when Mark Ronson was amongst the headline acts at the new Carnival 56 Festival. Sitting alongside this, Dundee has excellent educational institutions, each boasting great cultural links. I think I heard on the radio the other day that there are 60 different nationalities on the staff of the University of Dundee, which encompasses the excellent Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design. 
It's been ranked in the top 1% for art and design in the world. Turner Prize winners Suzanne Phillips and nominees David Mash, uh, Louise Wilson and Luke Fowler have all studied at Duncan and Jordanston. But of course, culture takes many forms, not just the traditional. We need to remember things like Dundee's thriving computer game sector, at the heart of which is Aberty University, which is this year celebrating 20 years since it became the first university in the world to offer degrees in computer games. In March, the prestigious Princeton Review ranked Aberté as best in Europe and in the world top 20 for its undergraduate and postgraduate courses, respectively. The university has become a melting pot of international games talent, with students accessing links to the likes of Sony, Disney and Ubisoft, while learning from a host of seasoned academic staff. The Dare to Play and this festivals act as excellent focal points for celebrating the industry in Dundee. And I should mention also Dundee and Angus College, so ably led by its principal, Grant Ritchie, who's identified the welcoming of students and staff from across the EU, as well as the regular exchanges that take place between the college and other European institutions, as helping to develop a modern, inclusive view of the world within that establishment. But why is an Angus MSP prepared to wax logical about the nearby city? Well, the thing is, all of us are benefiting and will continue to benefit from the transformation of Dundee. And it's my hope and belief that with the proper marketing, securing the City of Culture title and the general uh, increase in tourists that is expected from uh, Dundee, from the V&A and Waterfront Project, my constituency will reap further spin-offs. Whether it be cultural events such as Bonfest or those put on by Hospital Field House in Arbroath, excellent historical attractions such as Guam's Castle in Arbroath Abbey, or the glorious beaches, glens and golf courses. Angus South has so much to offer visitors and we need to make sure we capitalise on this opportunity. The cross-local authority work being done as part of the Taste Cities deal exemplifies what's achievable across the region through working together. President Officer, let me conclude by echoing the words of the leader of Dundee City Council, Councillor John Alexander. Dundee's putting itself on the map with its ambitious and bold cultural strategy. However, our work is not just about putting the city on the map, but in making sure that all maps lead to Dundee. This city is and has been going through a cultural renaissance over the last few years, and our journey towards 2023 is a hugely exciting opportunity. Be bold, be ambitious, be Dundee. Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Mary Fee to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Ms Fee, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by congratulating Paisley on making the shortlist for UK City of Culture. To have progressed this far is in itself testament to the strength of the bid, and I know that Paisley has got what it takes to win the title. I commend the bid team for all their hard work to date and wish them every success in the months to come. And I also want to commend the Dundee bid for European Capital of Culture, and particularly to recognise their appeal for the public to come forward with ideas and to be part of developing the city's proposal. However, as a West of Scotland MSP and a Renfrewshire resident, I hope the Chamber will understand that I want to focus my remarks this afternoon on Paisley. Because Paisley has some genuinely interesting stories to tell. Stories that I believe add to the bid. Stories of its people, its women, its quirks, and its quite unique history. And there's a cairn at the junction of Renfrew Road and Dundonald Road, not far from where I live. And it marks the spot where in 1316, Marjorie Bruce fell from her horse in a tragic accident. And Marjorie, as I'm sure people across the chamber will know, was the eldest daughter of Robert the Bruce. And she was, as the story goes, heavily pregnant when she fell. And people from round about tried to save her, but they couldn't. And Marjorie Bruce died aged just 19 and was buried at Paisley Abbey. Her son, however, was saved and he would go on to become King Robert II, the first king of the Stuart dynasty. And behind that cairn that people pass every single day on one of the busiest roads in Paisley, there is a story, a tragic story, but an important story nonetheless. And in the textured history of Paisley, and the rich history of Scotland. And it's a story that surely adds something to Paisley's claim to the City of Culture title. Recent events, however, have brought a very different story from Paisley's past back into the news. And it's the gruesome story of the Burgarden witches, hanged and burned at the Gallow Green in the west end of Paisley in 1697. 
And this was only five years after the start of the infamous Salem witch trials in Massachusetts. And it could even be said that Scotland was, uh, Paisley was Scotland's Salem. And one of the so-called Bergaran witches was Agnes Naismith. And before she died, she cursed everyone present at the trial and all of their descendants. And in the years that followed, it seemed that every tragedy and every misfortune to befall the people of Paisley was attributed to Agnes Naismith and the witch's curse. And the, the ashes of those who died were interred at the nearby Max Belton Cross, where there's a memorial to this day. And part of that memorial is a famous horseshoe, a horseshoe that's said to keep the town safe, safe from misfortune and from the witch's curse. And I'm sorry to have to inform the chamber that the horseshoe has been dislodged and there is absolutely nothing protecting Paisley from the curse. As the Paisley Daily Express said earlier this month, we are all doomed. And two community stalwarts and real Paisley legends, Piero Perrucini and Tony Lawler and the Paisley Development Trust are now racing to restore the memorial and reinstall the famous horseshoe. And I know that the whole chamber will wish them well in this endeavour, keeping the town safe and safeguarding Paisley's heritage at the same time. And finally, presiding officer, if the City of Culture competition is about using heritage to shape the renewal of a community, then the story of Paisley's weavers and Paisley's, Paisley's textiles has to be heard. Paisley was a market town before the rise of the textile industry, and it was transformed by the Industrial Revolution. As the bid team say themselves, Paisley made textiles, and textiles made Paisley. And of course, the Paisley pattern is world-renowned. An industry provided employment, and not just for men. Women came from the highlands and rural communities seeking job opportunities in Paisley. And during this period, we also saw the rise of what we today might recognise as trade unionism, as men and women got organised and demanded better rights for those working in the mills. And the Duslin stain, once used as a soapbox for the Weavers Union, now stands in Brodie Park and is used as a meeting point for the annual Small Shot Parade. Another local monument with another story behind it, every bit as much a part of the town as the mills themselves. Not just a monument, but a cultural asset. And presiding officer, the Paisley bid is all about using cultural and heritage assets to drive forward regeneration and to transform the town. And as I tried to demonstrate this afternoon, there's no shortage of those assets in Paisley. That's just one of the reasons why the Paisley bid is so strong. And I hope and expect that this bid will have the support from right across this chamber. And I do hope it's successful. And I hope that the stories of Paisley, the layers of history and the people who made the place are told for a long time to come. Thank you. Nice. I call Joan McAlpine, followed by Bill Bowman. Ms McAlpine, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, we are today debating the fine cultural achievements uh, of Paisley and Dundee, and quite right too. But I wanted to start the debate by referencing another great city, uh, Glasgow, the European City of Culture in 1990, which has in many ways led the way in showing Scotland how culture can transform a city and change its identity, not just in terms of national and international branding, but in self-perception and self-confidence. It's worth reflecting that when Glasgow began its transformative journey back in the 1980s, the proposal that culture could help replace jobs lost through deindustrialisation was a controversial one. Indeed, it was considered in some quarters eccentric and even dangerous. Back in 1990, when Glasgow was the city of culture, there were fearsome debates about whether the year-long festival was a waste of time and a waste of money. But Glasgow pressed ahead because it had firm economic underpinnings for its bid. It enlisted the help of John Myerscough, an academic, who led the way in measuring the economic impact of cultural spend and his 1988, 1988 report, The Economic Importance of the Arts in Glasgow, influenced generations of cultural economists and policymakers right around the world. 30 years, one concert hall and thousands of festivals later, 
Mayorkov has been vindicated in 2011. A follow-up report found that the market for culture overall in Glasgow had increased by 45% uh, between 1989 and 2008 9 and it was 20% higher than at the peak of 1990. And that didn't include clubbing, cinema and libraries. Uh, so 1990 uh, led directly to the two bids that we are debating today. You don't become the city of culture through a big bang approach, of course, uh, although most festivals do enjoy the fireworks at some point. But it's the investment that you make in creativity over time which counts. And both Paisley and Dundee already have excellent track records in that respect. Paisley's rich heritage in textiles, radical literature and music makes it more than a worthy contender for the title of the UK City of Culture. Others have mentioned uh, the deindustrialisation of Paisley, but the link between that long gone industry and culture is, is very tangible. Uh, without the mill workers uh, praised by Karl Marx, uh, we wouldn't have the poet weavers like Tannehill. We wouldn't have the slab boys who worked in the carpet factories, uh, the play by John Byrne, which we all know and love. And dare I say it, would we have had uh, the great prince without the Paisley pattern? So Paisley has given so much to the world and absolutely deserves to be a front runner for this, this bid. Dundee has the new V&A Museum of Design, complementing long-established centres of creative excellence, such as DCA and the Rep Theatre. And of course, uh, the art school, as others have mentioned. And we've got a great example of that very close to home in the Parliament uh, right now with Callum Colvin's excellent uh, Jacobite uh, exhibition down in the foyer of the Parliament, which I would encourage all members to have a look at. Independent analysis has suggested that the European title, if Dundee wins it, will generate 128 million uh, for the Dundee economy and create 1,600 uh, 1, new jobs. Whereas in Paisley, it's estimated that uh, winning the bid will boost the economy by 172 million and create 4,700 uh, new jobs, direct and indirectly. I'm not quite sure why the figures for Paisley are so much more optimistic than for the larger city of Dundee. Perhaps George Adam got his hands on them first. But whatever the... Yes. Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary. I think one is of a 10-year, uh, looking at a legacy from a 10-year perspective, and one is probably in a shorter term. So I think both of them show the importance, as, as the member is making, of economic generation and jobs, but they're using different time frames. Joe I thank the Minister for that clarification and uh, that, that there's no massaging going on. But what I was going on to say is that whatever the figure is, we, we, it's well established that creativity uh, creates jobs. In uh, 2012, uh, Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise commissioned a report into the economic contribution of the arts and the creative industries to Scotland as a whole. And it found that the direct, indirect uh, impact of the arts and creative industries amounted to 130,000 jobs, uh, 6.3 billion in gross value added and 12.4 uh, uh, billion in turnover. So Myerskoff's arguments all those years ago that culture creates jobs uh, are now un uncontroversial and taken as uh, read. But we also know that the, com uh, the, the contribution of creativity can do so much more than simply boost GVA. We're increasingly understanding that participation in cultural activity can improve health and well-being, for example. It's very important uh, for older people in tackling social isolation. It can improve confidence in young people and improve, improve educational attainment, not just in subjects linked to the arts, but right across the cur curriculum. Uh, it's well known that there's a close link, for example, between uh, attainment in music and attainment in mathematics. Uh, and cultural practitioners are no longer confined to marginalised roles. In, in some places in Scotland, such as Dundee and Edinburgh, and even the tiny village of Money Ive in Dumfrieshire, uh, which I represent, uh, we see artists working alongside planners and economists to repopulate empty streets and regenerate town and village centres. Um, I realise my time is short, uh, presiding officer, so I'm just going to conclude by wishing Paisley and Dundee all the very best um, 
Along with all the other merits, uh, the, the bids remind us of the importance that culture has in building bridges to the rest of the world and making us more outward looking, more generous and more tolerant. And for that reason, uh, I'm happy to support the motion today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms McAlpine. I call Bill Bowman to be followed by Tom Arthur. Mr Arthur will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Bowman. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, first of all, allow me to thank Fiona Hislop for bringing this debate forward. It gives us an opportunity to show our support for these two remarkable areas of Scotland and our, appreci our appreciation for all that they contribute to our cultural fabric. Like my fellow Scottish Conservatives, I give my full backing to the Paisley 2021 bid and I wish the team behind it and the people of Paisley every success. Today, though, I would like to focus on Dundee's bid to become European Capital of Culture 2023. Dundee, Dundee is an area I know, and I have the great good fortune to be able to represent this wonderful city as a regional MSP for the North East. Now, that's a good starting point because the North East is important that we recognise the challenges the region has faced over the last few years, and Dundee is no exception in this. The city has had to contend with both the wider regional downturn and several high profile job losses recently. All this against the backdrop of the decline of traditional industries across much of the country over the past decades. Changing times have seen those industries and jobs of the past disappear and Dundee, like many other parts, has found itself in need of a new direction. That is why the Dundee bid is so important. Dundee is not just aiming for the title of European capital of culture, Dundee is aiming for a new future and it is a city that has the ambition and drive to achieve this. For evidence of that, we need only to look to the fact that Dundee was named by UNESCO as the first city of design in the UK to see the recognition of that future given by the global audience. Within the city itself, the new V&A Museum of Design heralds the regeneration of the waterfront but it is also a symbol of the regeneration and transformation of the city as a whole. We see Dundee's ambition in the plans as laid out, and should its bid be successful, a renaissance of the culture, a renaissance of culture with a £40 million programme of up to 80 events, including six major arts festivals staged across the city. The ambition is backed up by the talent to deliver it, including Sir Jonathan Mills, former director of the Edinburgh International Festival. No one should be in any doubt about Dundee's determination to deliver. The potential economic benefits of success are many. As has been mentioned, up to 1,600 full-time jobs could be created and as much as £128 million could be injected into the local economy. Tourism is estimated to shoot up by as much as 50% in the short term and by almost a fifth over the long term. The wider Northeast could benefit also. Regional GDP is in line to receive a very welcome and much needed boost of up to 4.5%. All of this is important, all of this I welcome, and all of this is achievable, but it is not the full story. Beyond the numbers, Dundee would stand to gain something else, a new role to play in Scotland's story. The motion we are debating today notes the importance of Dundee's existing contribution to Scottish culture, and I wholeheartedly agree. Dundee has given us so much, from DC Thompson's beloved comics and newspapers, not to confuse the titles within those um, descriptions, to the world's first radio broadcast in 1832 by a James Bowman Lindsay, but not someone I know as a, as a relative, to being the important centre, as we've heard, for the video games industry and with world-class education and life sciences um, capacity, capability. Dundee has many famous sons and daughters, such as women's rights advocate and missionary Mary Slessor, and can even count William Wallace himself amongst their ranks, Wallace having been educated in Dundee in the 1290s and apparently killed his first man there as well. Dundee has a rich history, but being named European Capital of Culture would, be open, would open the door to an equally rich future. Only two other British cities have ever been named European Capital of Culture, Glasgow and Liverpool. That underscores just how significant a win for Dundee would be. In fact, 
has been, as has been mentioned, we need to only look to Glasgow to see the impact winning that title can have. From a city founded on heavy industry to a renowned centre of culture, learning and the arts, tourists, conferences and events flood into Glasgow. Glasgow has made that transformational leap and continues to reap the rewards. Now it is Dundee's turn. In closing, I have a request for each of you. Come to Dundee. Come and see its galleries and museums. Come and eat in its cafes and restaurants. Come and visit its concerts and gigs. Most of all, come and see why Dundee deserves to win. I'm very happy to support the motion. Thank you. I thought you were offering to pay for a moment. Uh, I called Tom Arthur, last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, presiding officer. As someone who was born in Paisley, who was brought up in nearby Barhead, and as one of Renfrewshire's free constituency MSPs, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to join colleagues from across the chamber today in supporting the government's motion, wishing the best for Paisley 2021 and Dundee 2023. My colleague, George Adam, is fond of saying, as he did earlier, that Paisley is my kind of town. And I don't think anyone would disagree with him, but I can also say that it's, it's my kind of town too. Alex Cole Hamilton spoke earlier um, very eloquently of his relationship with Dundee growing up, and I can relate to that growing up in Barhead. Paisley was the town of dazzling lights compared to Barhead. Paisley was where we went Christmas shopping. Glasgow was a dark and distant place we would only go on very rare occasions. Um, presiding officer, just like the communities in my own constituency of Renfrewshire South, Paisley is a great place to live, work and invest in. It is a town rich in heritage from the legacy of its mills when Paisley literally had the world in a string to its magnificent architecture which can be enjoyed all year round, night and day, come rain or come shine. And while Paisley has a proud past, it also has a dynamic and exciting future. Just like its MSP, while it may look old on the outside, in reality, Paisley is young at heart. With an expanding array of great bars, restaurants, and a developing music scene, it's clear that for Paisley, the best is yet to come. P Paisley also has a fantastic community spirit, not only demonstrated in the way the town has come together to back the bid, but also ex um, brilliantly exemplified by the football fan ownership story of the St Mirren Independent Supporters Association, which I know George, while not chairman of the board, has been heavily involved in. Well, Dundee has had the honour of being the first Scottish city to be shortlisted for UK City of Culture. I have high hopes that Paisley will be successful for Scotland the second time around. I also believe that Dundee, after the disappointment of losing out previously on UK City of Culture, can now become a European capital of culture. While I am not a Dundee native myself, it is a great city that I have had a, a long-standing relationship with. Ten years ago, when I had friends who went to Dundee University, I had many, many great nights out, what I can remember of them, in Dundee. And I know how internationally renowned it's becoming as a centre of creative and digital excellence. I was struck um, four years ago when I was in Japan in the, the famous world-renowned Shibuya Crossing in Tokyo to see a huge billboard, I think it was Grand Theft Auto V, Rockstar North Games, and to think all the way from Dundee to the heart of Tokyo, an incredible story. So just as 1990 was a very good year for Glasgow as European capital of culture, so 2021 and 2023 can be great years for both Paisley and Dundee. Presiding officer, when I last spoke in Parliament on Paisley 2021 in December of last year, I said that becoming UK City of Culture would be a boon not just to Paisley, but to, whole, to the whole of Renfrewshire and indeed the west of Scotland. I wish to reiterate that today. The potential to create an equivalent of 4,700 jobs will bring new employment opportunities to many, including my own constituents in Renfrewshire South. The predicted boost to the local economy of £172 million could be shared in by organisations in Renfrewshire South, like the Community Run Bank Cafe in Newston, the superb Papa Max Gourmet Kitchen in Johnston, or the award-winning Up Lemur Hotel, not to mention the range of restaurants and bars at the Phoenix and Linwood. And with as many as 1.7 million attendees, those wishing to explore beyond Paisley could enjoy great attractions such as the Dams to Darnley Country Park that borders Barhead, the Weaver's Cottage in Colbarkin, or the gateway to Scotland's largest regional park, Clydemuir Shield in Loch Winnock. Presiding officer, the success of Paisley in being shortlisted is indicative of the growing confidence, confidence of not only of that great town, but of many of Scotland's post-industrial communities. No longer in the west of Scotland do we say, it's not for us and put our dreams away. And while we now walk a little taller, we take nothing for granted. 
We are all aware of the hard work that has been put in to get Paisley to this stage. It has certainly not been nice and easy. Now, though, we are in the final lap, and I am delighted the Scottish Government is going to be backing Paisley day in, day out, all the way. While with high-stake prestigious awards like City of Culture can feel like a zero-sum game, all or nothing at all, it's clear that Paisley and Renfrewshire have already benefited from the civic reinvigoration brought about by the bid process. As marvellous as this process has been to watch, for Paisley to, uh, for Paisley to win would be too marvellous for words. Presiding officer, as we approach the announcement of UK City of Culture 2021 in December, let us start spreading the news across Scotland and beyond that it's Paisley that should win and let's work together to make it happen. Thank you. <laughs> Who is counting the Sinatra quotes? Uh, I call on Lewis MacDonald to wind up for Labour at seven minutes. And I say to Morris Golden, you will have eight minutes. <laughs> Mr MacDonald. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Often in this place we have to agree to differ. That, after all, is the essence of parliamentary debate. Taking issue is an essential part of any modern democracy, and it is something that we Scots have excelled at over many generations. Uh, but sometimes we have to agree to agree, because there is no issue between us. And that is clearly the case in supporting the bids we have been discussing today. Bids for recognition as centres of cultural life are, by definition, competitive. And the race between Paisley and Perth to challenge for the title of UK City of Culture in 2021 was no different. But we have heard today all the qualities which make Paisley's bid so strong as it goes forward to the final stage with unanimous support in this Parliament and enthusiastic backing across Scotland. The City of Dundee has likewise attracted very broad support in its bid to be a European capital of culture in 2023 and goes forward with a fair and indeed a strong wind behind it. This award goes back over 30 years to when Melina Mercuri in Greece and Jack Lang in France came up with the idea of recognising individual cities as cultural capitals, not just of individual countries, but of Europe as a whole. And over that time, capitals of culture, like UK cities of culture, have stimulated both artistic creativity and economic growth in a series of cities both great and small. As Bill Bowman mentioned, Glasgow and Liverpool are the only previous British holders of a European title, and their year as a European city of culture or capital of culture was memorable and significant in the regeneration and reinvention of both those great cities, as indeed Joan McAlpine and others reminded us this afternoon. So Dundee now has the chance to join that august company, and it is clearly well placed to do so. The celebration of contemporary arts and repertory theatre, the v &A Museum of Design, the redevelopment of the waterfront, all contribute already to the cultural life of the city and of the country, and there is clearly more to come. At the same time, as my colleague Jenny Mara reminded us in supporting a previous such bid four years ago, Dundee also has too many communities where cultural life and access to health and jobs and hope for the future are still in too short supply. So it is well placed to be creative but it is also well placed to turn cultural opportunity into economic and social benefit, and so to make the most of this title if it is awarded in 2023, building on the transformation over the last 30 years, which was highlighted by Graham Day. This is a European Union competition, but the competition for 2023 is to represent Britain in Europe, an interesting and momentous uh, challenge. The successful candidate will be chosen by a panel of 12 judges, of whom 10 are from other European countries. From other European countries. But the cities or regions competing with Dundee for this title are all from elsewhere in the United Kingdom. This is because EU member states take it in turns to be recognised uh, or to put forward candidates to be recognised as capitals of culture. And in 2023, that uh, honour will fall on the United Kingdom and also on Hungary. So like Paisley in the UK City of Culture competition, Dundee has to win its bid in uh, face of competition from other cities and centres around these islands. The difference in this case uh, being that the judges come from across the EU. And the judging panel will shortlist bids in the next few weeks and make a final decision next year. Getting through the first stage will depend on the quality of the submissions the cities put forward and eventual success will depend on who is best able to work up their submission 
into a really convincing proposal. The sheer range and variety of cultural strengths of Dundee that we have heard about already, and I think we'll hear more from the Minister about in a moment, will help it in that task, as will, critically, as Mary Fee said, the involvement of so many Dundonians in developing the bid. As a member for North East Scotland, I often reflect, as Graeme Day did, on the relationship between the two cities which I am fortunate enough to represent. Although they are joined in a single parliamentary region, both Aberdeen and Dundee are regional centres in their own right. And part of what makes a city region is the strength of cultural identity, of how much there is in common and seem to be in common uh, between town and country, between a city and its region, so that people in Inchon and Ruri take pride in the name and reputation of Aberdeen, while Dundee attracts the same loyalty from people in Kirimuir and further beyond. That regional solidarity, as the Cabinet Secretary said, is a critical strength of Dundee's bid for 2023. Aberdeen and Dundee, of course, compete mightily in all manners of field, from academic research to sporting prowess. Both cities aspired to the title of UK City of Culture in 2017. And just as Dundee has used that experience as a springboard to bid for European Capital of Culture 2023, so Aberdeen has taken the first steps uh, forward towards a bid for UK City of Culture in 2025. My friend and former colleague Frank Doran, who came from Dundee to represent Aberdeen at Westminster 30 years ago, has always described competition between our two great northeast cities as a source of creative tension. And these ongoing bids for cultural recognition prove that he is right about that. Creative tension, after all, is what this process is all about. It is in demonstrating to other people across Scotland, across Britain and across Europe that Paisley and Dundee have so many strengths and attributes that they can carry forward uh, onto an international stage. That is what, makes, uh, that is what adds to the excellent, excellence that they have to offer and makes these bids so strong, uh, representing us all. Because Paisley and Dundee are standard bearers for all of Scotland in these competitions, and I know that they have the full support, as we have heard today from around the chamber, the full support uh, of all concerned. Not only that, but we also look forward to many more opportunities for Scotland's great cities and towns to fly the flag as UK cities of culture and European capitals of culture in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Call Morris Golden. Mr. Golden, the course for Conservatives, eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and allow me to thank Fiona Hislop for bringing uh, this debate forward. Both myself and my Scottish Conservative colleagues are grateful for the opportunity to show both our party support for Paisley and indeed for Dundee. I think it's important that the MSP show that support because these bids are more about than just securing titles. They are a sign to the world that Scotland is ambitious and is determined to succeed in the 21st century. Some members are fortunate to have a connection with either Paisley or Dundee. I'm fortunate that I have a strong connection to both. I was educated in Dundee, as was, as my colleague Bill Bowman noted, uh, William Wallace. In fact, I went to the very same school as uh, Wallace did, uh, albeit a mere 700 years after he did. The similarity ends there, though. However, Braveheart is one of my favourite films. But today we have heard support from across the chamber for both Paisley and Dundee, a tale of two cities, as Fiona Hislop outlined in her opening remarks, describing them as committed, bold and ambitious bids. My colleagues and others across the chamber have made eloquent cases for Dundee to be named European City of Culture. Alex Cole Hamilton spoke about Dundee as a metropolis where he went shopping and to experience nightlife in the form of the sticky carpets of the Mardi Gras nightclub. I may have bumped into him, but less said about that, the better, um, in a very thoughtful and interesting speech. Uh, Graham's day, first, uh, his first visit to Dundee was the year before I was born. He's certainly showing his age there. Um, but he spoke about the positive transformation of the city and urged us all to be bold, be ambitious, and be Dundee. 
Uh, suffice to say, it is uh, uh, that the world would be poorer without Dundee's cultural contributions, and there is a lot more yet to come. Dundee deserves to win, and I am more than happy to offer any support I can. Turning to Paisley, it is a great honour as an MSP for the West of Scotland region to be able to represent the town. I have previously spoken about the Paisley 2021 bid in this chamber. I said that Paisley needed it, Paisley deserved it, and Scotland stood to benefit from it. I am more convinced of that now than ever. Take a stroll through Paisley streets and you will find architecture that would be at home in any European capital. From being the home of the world-renowned Paisley pattern textile design, which I'm sporting today, if you can see it in my tie, um, uh, to the location of the formulation of the duty of care, which was mentioned by my colleague Liam Kerr. Um, the legal joke didn't go down so well in the chamber, but the point that Paisley has much to be proud of uh, was uh, resonating. Neil Bibby spoke about his pride at being born and, and indeed living in Paisley, as well as the economic benefits of the bid. Ross Greer spoke about the radical movement and communism, as well as the rich cultural heritage. I wasn't sure if the two were linked. George Adam, who could hardly contain himself in his seat, looked forward to an afternoon of positive Paisleyness. And I think you've got that, uh, Mr. Adam. He acknowledges the challenges, but also the cultural heritage of the town, claiming that Paisley was the center of the universe. Maurice Corey highlighted his links to Dundee and Paisley from serving in the army in Dundee, as well as his experience in the textile industry in Paisley. Tom Arthur spoke about the benefits to the wider Renfrewshire area and urged us all to start spreading the news. It was Paisley's own Paolo Nettini who spoke of seeing the romance of the town, the real beauty of it, and I couldn't agree more. Dundee can also be proud of its musical heritage and was the launch pad for groups such as the Average White Band and Snow Patrol, as well as the home for Ricky Ross, as well as folk singers such as the Bard of Dundee, Michael Mara, and I'm sure Jenny Mara would have mentioned if you, she were able to be in the uh, chamber today. Yes, Claire Adamson. Claire Adamson. It was just given his earlier comments uh, to Mr. Day. Um, um, does he actually remember the average white band? <laughs> Mr. Golden. Uh, it was a question when I was doing my uh, uh, short course standard grade music. It was one of the, <laughs> it was one of the answers. So, that was a, that's the reason why I, I actually uh, I, I was taught about them, but I didn't live the experience. Um, uh, but I, I'm happy to uh, to listen uh, uh, to the average white band with the member if that was a, a, an invitation. That would be nice. Um, uh, so I'm sure Jenny Mara w would have mentioned uh, her uncle where she uh, to be here today. Also worth a listen is Simon Kempston's Ode to Dundee, which is called A City Beautiful, which gives a bit of a historiography of, of the city and the previous uh, uh, um, uh, issues uh, with that, but uh, it's well worth uh, a look at. So while Paisley has Gerard Butler, Dundee has Brian Taylor, and Brian and I share at least three things in common. We both attended Dundee High School, we are Dundee United fans, and we spent much of our formative years on the 12th floor of the Gowrie Hill Multi in the Minas, Minas Hill area of Dundee. Now, um, I, I can expand at a later date. Now, Paisley has a lot going for it, but similar to Dundee, it faces challenges. Uh, sadly, Paisley suffers from appalling rates of poverty, including almost a third of the town's children living in severe deprivation. Now, winning the title might not seem as a solution to these problems, but it can help to drive economic benefits. Joe McAlpine made the point that culture creates jobs, and I think that's something that I would agree with. 
Dundee has uh, so much to offer, uh, as does Paisley, and the success of these bids should benefit everyone, especially the most vulnerable. I'm delighted to see the organisers of both committees recognise this and they are committed to ensuring that no one is left out. I believe this long-term, community-minded approach serves to raise support for both bids. The latter being a welcome reminder that there are more that unites us than there is to divide us. On that note, I welcome the £10 million of funding from the Scottish Government that they have committed to the Paisley bid, and I know that any information on further funding would be appreciated locally. The next decade has the potential to begin with two of Scotland's most vibrant centres leading the UK and Europe in culture and arts. I am pleased to offer my support for the motion. Thank you very much, Mr Gold. I call Joe Fitzpatrick to close with the Government uh, Cabinet Secretary till five o'clock, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And um, I want to start by thanking business managers across the Chamber for agreeing not only that we should schedule today's business, but that we should make sure that we do it in a way that we can have a motion that we all agree to, supporting both these um, two uh, very important bids. Because I, I do think it's very important, and I, I think both bid teams will be very grateful for the contributions across the chamber. It has been a really good debate, and it has shown, I think, as I think um, Alex Cole Hamilton said earlier, it's shown the Parliament at its best um, when we, we come together and um, in, in the way we have today. It is very clear that there is a shared appreciation and indeed passion for both Paisley and Dundee's bids and the ambitions that they represent. It's great to hear the consensus around the Chamber for the range of cultural, economic and social benefits that these bids will bring. Benefits not just for Paisley, Dundee and surrounding areas, but for individuals, communities and organisations across Scotland, the UK and Europe. Um, so I, I really do thank the Chamber for the quality and depth of today's um, debate. The passion and enthusiasm um, is something that anyone who didn't manage to sit through all of today, it's worth um, going back and having a look. And I'm, I'm not just talking about George Adams' passion for Dundee, although that was... <laughs> yes, it was Dundee. <laughs> I, I, I didn't actually have to pay George um, to agree to, to, to mention Dundee in, in his speech. Um, we, we had a, a, a discussion and I promised that I would mention Paisley in my speech. Um, but actually, the important thing is both of these bids are not competing. The, the two bids are very, very complementary. Um, and I know that the, 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 the two bid teams are, are looking to learn from each other. Obviously, Dundee has some experience from its previous bid, as, as, as um, Morris, had, Morris Corey had mentioned, um, for to be a UK City of Culture 2017. Unfortunately, very narrowly, narrowly picked the post, but um, there's lots of lessons that Dundee has learned from that bid, and I know that, that, that Dundee has been sharing that with, um, with, with Paisley. Um, Liam uh, Kerr um, talked a bit about the, the, the connection between uh, culture and history and the importance of, of those to um, tourism. But I, I guess, maybe I'll, I'll try and be as gentle as I can. When talking about football, there is some history that is best forgotten. <laughs> um, <laughs> Neil uh, Bibby um, talked of his sense of pride in terms of the work that had been done in bringing the bid together. I, I think the, the, the tributes that he paid to the, the bid team um, are, are very, very well, well made. And of course, the bid team in Dundee too um, have put a huge amount of work in, into that. Obviously, Paisley are further down the line, so the, 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 the efforts that have gone in there have been immense. And so, I, again, I, I know that the bid teams in both Paisley and Dundee will be very grateful to, to hear that recognised here in the, in the Scottish Parliament. Ross Greer um, somehow managed to weave um, Karl Marx and radical politics in, into the, to, to highlight the rich tapestry of Paisley's culture. Um, and, and he too um, mentioned the importance of um, not just winning the bid, but the process of the bid. And that is certainly something that our experience in Dundee um, that, that actually the, we've, we, learned, we, not, we didn't just learn a lot about the, the, the process of applying to be UK City, City of Culture 2017, but we gained a lot and it took us on that journey. And so I'm sure that that, that is the case for Paisley too, although, um, as, as um, has been said, Paisley is in it to win it. I think it was said by Neil Bibby. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton 
um, talked about his youth in crossing the Tay, and I, I think in recent, recent um, journeys across, you may have noticed that the lemons are back. Um, they certainly were an important part of any journey that I made um, across heading from Dundee to Fife. Um, uh, the lemons are back, but and, and the lemons, I, I think, represent to some extent the circle of, of how history and, and culture um, move forward and remind us just about just how far Dundee has, has come on its cultural uh, revival. It, it really is remarkable um, what's, what's happened in that. Um, I, I think what, what was one of the interesting things also from Alec Cole Hamilton's um, speech and, and Morris Golden to some extent was that they were both hitting the same clubs in Dundee and um, not, not the clubs that I attended to and I have to say I did not attend any of the sticky carpet clubs with, uh, with, with, with Alec or, or Morris uh, not, not <laughs> um, obviously as expected George Adam uh, waxed lyrically um, about Paisley um, <coughs> Um, but one of, one of the things that he, that he did, did say, um, as well as waxing lyrically, was how um, similar Paisley and Dundee are, and, and how much alike they are. It's been said by a few folk that obviously Paisley are not an official city, but they're about the size of most cities. Um, and actually, while Dundee has always been recognised as a city, I think both Paisley and Dundee are two of Scotland's biggest villages. And I think these are one of the, the benefits that both Paisley and Dundee have, is that they are like a village, everybody kens everybody, and, and those connections um, are really important in terms of taking these bids forward. So Paisley's bid is stronger because the way that people can work across community um, and across party political lines, Neil was... Neil, Neil Bibby made the point about the, 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 the bid was originally taken forward by a, a Labour council supported by an SNP opposition and now it's been carried forward by an SNP council supported by a Labour opposition and that is really important and that's something that we have seen in Dundee as well on every occasion um, when, when we've, we've talked about Dundee's culture we've, we've had support from right across the political spectrum going way back to the, um, the day in, I think it was Graham Day that talked about the waterfront plan, way back in 2001 when I was a, a local councillor in opposition in Dundee um, and we, as a, as, a, as a council, drew up that fantastic waterfront plan to see how we could take Dundee forward and it's because we were able to stick the party politics aside that we've managed to go through, starting with a Labour administration, moving to a Labour Conservative alliance, moving to an SNP um, administration. We've managed to put the politics aside through all those years, way right back to 2001, to make sure that we are all doing the best for Dundee. Of course. Yeah, okay. Can I thank the Minister for taking the intervention that allows me to have a word in this debate? Would the Minister agree with me that Dundee, the city, and Paisley, the town, and all the neighbouring communities will benefit from both the bid and ultimately, hopefully, victory? And for that matter, Scotland will benefit if either bid, and indeed, hopefully, both bids are ultimately successful. Jovis Patrick. I think the Cabinet Secretary makes a very strong point. Um, it's a point that Graham Day made, and obviously, as, as a, 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 an MSP, from a neighbouring constituency and from Arthur also made as an, an MSP from the neighbouring constituency to Paisley. The, 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 the reach of culture is far more than the direct um, input of cash, the input of the resource in, in the cities where the culture is happening. And I fully expect that um, both Dundee and Paisley's bids, hopefully both will be successful, will benefit um, much wider than um, just the cities themselves and much wider than the, the city region across the, the, the greater areas, across the whole of Scotland and, and hopefully we'll continue to keep those connections um, across the UK and across Europe. Um, Maurice Corey, um, in addition to the points I've already mentioned, also mentioned his history in terms of the Black Watch. Clearly, the Black Watch is very much part of Dundee's cultural past and, and cultural future. Um, one of the points that Graham Day made when he gave away his age, but I wasn't going to say, um, um, uh, but, but, but Morris, Morris Golden already has, so um, 
Graham talked about the transformation that has happened to Dundee over those years since that waterfront pl front plan was first envisaged in 2001. And anybody that hasn't been to Dundee in the last two or three years, um, you really should, should come and see the, the, the difference that's here, that, that is there. One, one of the biggest differences, though, which, which maybe you can't see, is the confidence in our city. And the, 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 the Dundee 2017 bid was really very much part of the, the rejuvenation of the confidence of our city. No longer did we just have to accept a lot. Dundee um, gained the confidence and believed that we had the, the right to, as, uh, as, as effectively our unofficial um, slogan, to be bold, to be ambitious, to be Dundee. Um, Mary Fee um, reminded us of the importance of stories from uh, Robert Stewart to witches to weavers and to this new chapter in Paisley's story. Um, really, really important. Joe McAlpine talked about something I thought was very important right at the very start of, 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 of her speech. Um, anyone who ever asks culture, why, why spend money on culture? Surely we should be spending money on this, that or the next thing. Just needs to look back to what the Glasgow European capital of culture did for that city way back in 1990. An absolute transformation for that city um, and, and a real boost to its confidence and, and we can think of all the things that happened thereafter. And, and I think she was right in saying that, that it would have been very difficult to envisage all those things um, had whoever it was within the council at that time not had the courage to say, this is something we need to do. This has to be a priority for our city. Um, Bill Bowman outlined uh, the Dundee bid programme, um, but he also crucially talked about the economic potential of all that programme, the bid process, and hopefully the final winning, winning the point, and I want to echo his closing words of come to Dundee. Um, Tom Arthur, I've mentioned very quickly. Presiding officer, um, time is coming uh, to an end, um, so I'll go right to the end of my speech. Um, so I want to finish by thanking all members for their contributions, and I'm really pleased that the motion will, I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure, uh, pass unanimously at decision time. That's, that's a an endorsement for the bids in, of Dundee and Paisley that I'm sure those bid teams will be very grateful for. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes our debate on cities of culture. And our next item of business is consideration of two business motions, motion 7912, setting out a business programme, and motion 7913 on an extension to a stage one timetable. I would ask anyone who objects to say so now. And I call on Mr. Vispa. But Mr Fitzpatrick, in this case, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move the motions. Moved on behalf of the Bureau. Thank you very much. No one has asked to speak against the motions. Therefore, the question is that motions 7912 and 7913 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 7914 on acting conveners. And again, I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Bureau, to move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. And this question will be put at decision time. So there's two questions today. The first question is that motion 7862 in the name of Fiona Hislop on recognise and support Paisley's 2021 UK City of Culture and Dundee's 2023 European Capital of Culture bids be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 7914 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on acting conveners be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business and I would ask members just to... Be quiet as we leave the chamber and we'll take a few moments to change seats.